Thank you very much. So um, I will immediately ask also to be joined on stage by my panelists. So if I can start by Ignacio Perez Dominguez from the Joint Research Center, uh, then Antonia Luteken, if I can also ask, ask you to join us um, from DG Agri, uh, then Tassos Haniotis, I don't need to present you Tassos anymore, uh, and then Elizabeth Nadeau from the IEP, be careful, yeah, and Anna Rocha from the European Land Owners Organization. Thank you. We will be just needing to share the microphones. That should be fine. Okay, good. The sound is working. Yes, Perfect. Um, so first, thank you very much for staying with us, uh, also for the panel. The weather is helpful, uh, and you always see that you are part of the agriculture discussion when everything is starting by the weather and finishing by the weather, uh, then you know that this is really the topic. Um, also, uh, we are very glad to be uh, co-organizing that event as a forum for the future of agriculture. Uh, this is just to give you the background. Uh, we have our annual conference uh, in March on the 26th. You are, of course, all um, warmly invited. That will be taking place in Brussels. Uh, and the outcomes of the entire discussions and of um, today's presentations will be also feeding um, the agenda of the forum uh, because, of course, is linked. Every, every, everything now is linked to the reform of the CEP and next steps. Uh, so that's also why we are uh, being a part of, of that discussion today. Um, so plenty of things were said already. You have been also very active asking questions. Uh, so I will just ask you for two, three minutes of reactions, um, how to maybe integrate this um, tremendous amount of knowledge which was presented and which is present in the room uh, in like towards policy recommendations, what we're supposed to do, uh, because very often we have, or I have the impression that it's still as, as a ministry of uh, silly walks, if I can do a reference also to Monty Python. Um, so how we should do better. Ignacio, we will start by you. Thank, Thank you. you. So thanks, thanks for the invitation. Uh, as you know, I, I work at the commission in the scientific uh, uh, arm of it. Uh, so doing some of this analysis and I've been following closely also these this projects. I think we, we learned quite a lot today and I think was a, I, I liked a lot uh, the presentations that were given and I also received a few uh, questions and, uh, and information that you would like us to talk about. Um, you, we've been talking about different tools. I think uh, we are moving into a um, situation where um, environmental goods and other non-marketed goods are important and we have uh, problems to analyze this, uh, these elements of the CAP, uh, which are more and more important, climate, uh, biodiversity, uh, soil carbon, we, we, you mentioned. Um, so we have already uh, detected data problems, and we uh, have uh, found out that bottom-up tools are key. Um, I saw very good presentations from the Besmark Consortium, um, also uh, different uh, tools that are more targeted in uh, farm, farm analysis. So I, I would say that uh, these data-driven tools and also in the, in, the, in the years of artificial intelligence are, are very important and we should probably move a little bit away from core market-centered uh, market tools. So we are not analyzing any more price intervention. Uh, we're not analyzing any more that much uh, export subsidies. This, this is information. Price continues being one of the main drivers of uh, farmer, uh, farmers' uh, action, but uh, we have to pay attention to this, to this thing. So uh, take into account the market environment, but focus on the, um, the bottom-up approaches. Very, very short. Costs and benefits are important. We, have, we always talk about costs. We don't talk about the benefits. It's very important. When we saw that there's a certain lack of ambition in some of the uh, AA, AES that we have been considering. This has to do also with policy constraints, with the way the CAP has been evolving over time. But we need to pay attention to the benefits that those uh, schemes uh, uh, bring about. Um, policy constraints, and I think Tassos maybe will talk a little bit more about this, are, are key. We see the farmers striking. We have to be clear. We have to simplify the message to farmers. We have to focus on the, on the, tool, on, on the policies that have an effect on the environment, but also are easy to convey and easy to monitor, uh, which brings us to my, my last point. Monitoring is key. 
And this is probably the most difficult thing because we, we lack data, we like uh, we like a lot of information, and um, and it's very difficult to uh, set up policies that you cannot monitor. And with this, I pass the floor to my. Thank you. So, yep, Antonia. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the invitation, first of all. Uh, in particular, uh, let's say the, uh, to dare to, to invite uh, the Commission in uh, doing all these CAP uh, plans, which are so much uh, criticized on, on uh, many occasions. Uh, as to your question, and I will leave the questions of the, of the paper, of the concept paper, mainly for, maybe for later how to reach out with these results of these three uh, very interesting and, and, and important projects is um, I see the Dutch minister ministry being represented here, but I think I would have liked to see 27 more or 26 more. So uh, because we have the researchers, we have the, the EU policy because you managed to come to Brussels, so we have the EU level, but what is missing is, let's say, the national man, uh, level of those who are programming. Because maybe to, to put it in one short sentence, I still, I have negotiated uh, 27 cap plans of this period. I have negotiated uh, s uh, the, some rural development programs of, of the last period for, for some member states and regions. Um, there are a lot of critics on, on the EU policy level, on the regulations, but I would still believe the CAP regulation as it was designed this time had a lot of opportunities. They were not taken up, and I, I'm happy to come to this uh, any further in, into more details. So my first point would be really to get the, the, the member states on board and the policy level and, and uh, to speak with them on the opportunities and for more details maybe later. Thank you. Thank you. Tassos. <laughs> May I give you mine? Yeah. <laughs> they trust me, yeah. It comes with retirement and you forget about things. Now, three, three broad areas I would like to, to mention. First of all, uh, I mean, so let's say that I'm surprised. No, I'm not, because every time that we have a cap reform, we start discussing about the next, but some of you also mentioned the issue of the time frame. I mean, we have to get serious a little bit about this policy cycle. I don't believe uh, in the last draft you put for a very simple reason. It would require a change of the treaty, and if you open up the treaty, you lose the European Union. But there are some basic pertinent issues that we have to address again. The first of all has to do with the, the time frame, both in terms of the policy cycle, but it also in terms of the time that it takes to see the results of the measures that we uh, start. And before we even implement the measures, we know what works or what doesn't work, or at least we think we know when we move to the next one. They, there is a problem there. To give you a very concrete example, December 2015, we had the Paris Agreement. For me, this is one of the biggest negotiation successes of the European Union. In, that was the 22nd of December, if I remember. On the 9th of January of 2017, I just checked before my files, which means one year later, we presented to the regulatory scrutiny board the uh, inception impact assessment of the CAP. So immediately we responded to the needs of the Paris Agreement. If you look at the policy cycle, we started implementing the Common Agricultural Policy in January 2023. So you start with prices, for example, low, you end up with a decision where prices are higher, or what have you. I mean, there is a problem there that has to be addressed in one way or the other. Second thing, from the, the big aspects, uh, I spoke about management but, uh, biases, but I forgot to mention what is my bias. It's a role of soil and land management. Soil, water, air, and biodiversity, I think you remember, these are things that I put, that I put in the environmental priorities. But for me, that was the order. Biodiversity, air, water is where you see the problems, but where the problems are created are in soil. And if we manage to address improvements in soil everywhere, we're going to have benefits in all the other three areas, which the other way around, in my view, doesn't always work. And that is one of the areas 
where I also have a bias in the debate about public money for public goods. I spent some time in England ages ago at White College. There were six farmers there, there is one in the area, the land is still the same. If that were the structure of the European Union agricultural, yes, but the structure is very different and there are failures in the money for private goods. So we need to combine, but we obviously need to retarget even the money that goes for the private goods. Now, how we do that, and that's the second area. We have a dilemma, nudging versus imposing, and we've seen the results of imposing. So we need to nudge, and to nudge farmers, first you need to have farm advisory systems that function, and we don't have them everywhere especially public farm advisory systems. But what we need to do is we also find, need to find clever ways of bypassing the lack of such systems, and we can do it with the importance of role models of farms. I mean, you have given the examples. I'm coming from Greece where there is, and we brought in, in the Agricultural Outlook Conference some years ago, a young farmer, he doesn't even receive any payments. He moved into uh, precision farming in rice, 150 hectares at the time. There are 2,500 hectares around the area that have moved in precision farming, not because anybody told him, but they saw what he's doing. And if you see the results, birds are all over the place during the winter time, exactly because of the major changes. And there is there also, um, I mean, part of the explanation why we have the limited role of current agro-environmental measures. Because we tend to focus on part of the area, not all of the area. And if you, I mean, I always thought that by increasing the conditionality of all of the area, even by a little, you might have greater multiplier effects and actually focus on some areas. And third and last area on data issues. Ah, that's, that I could go forever. Eh? We lost the opportunity to have a farm sustainability data network already five years ago because of the so-called privacy of data. Privacy of which data? Economic data, of course, are private, and we have had an enormous record of actually protecting it. But the heck, we got satellite imagery that gives what is a public good to everybody. They get it from free from the European Union, and they sell it to others based on this data. There is no, and there shouldn't be any privacy of this data. And we need to find good ways of doing it. And I, there are horror stories in the manner by which, with all due respect, our lawyers interpreted in the most narrow uh, mind sometimes what goes into the regulations, which is actually what goes because member states want to, to impose it. So there is also a pressure and a debate between the quantity and the quality of the data, the way we have gone with co-decision, it says in the, I mean, the logic is you have in the recitals a link to an article that you should have studied in the impact assessment. But if you go in co-decision, you have somebody that says, and whereas I believe that the earth is flat, if this is necessary in the procedure for decision making, you will see the whereas and whereas the earth is flat. And then the court of auditors come and says, where is the earth flat? Puff, it's the fault of the common agricultural policy. I exaggerate, but that's a, how some of these decisions are taken out there. And the last point, which comes to that is, okay, and what about the feedback? And what about the, uh, the relationship between the institutions? And here, I've put it in between the lines in the 2014 reform, because I was still in the commission and sticking my neck too much out, as I always did. But I have come also more strongly here. All three institutions need to learn a lesson here. Fourth, I will put the Court of Auditors because they will do it with the press releases. If you look at the reports, they're very serious. The press release is very uh, slogan type. Now, the Commission, when it makes a proposal, it's based on, and it should be based on, solid analysis. But that requires a communication strategy during negotiations to explain why the heck the Commission came with this proposal. Second, in co-decision, member states, the role of the presidency becomes extremely important. So member states negotiate with another member state. Do they trust another member state? They play the same tricks. So instead of having a limited number of things to, to come and agree upon, you have a long list that makes you know, 
the, uh, the legislation much more complex than one needs to be. And finally, there is a European Parliament that doesn't have what the Americans have, a Congressional Research Service. A service that would do analysis that would tell the parliamentarians this doesn't make any sense. And maybe that would have helped. Thanks. Then Elizabeth, from the stakeholder point of view, um, and I, I would say that with the presidency, it's not much easier when you have two national strategic plans from the Belgium presidency already. So, you know, it's also complicating things. But Elizabeth, especially that you have prepared also some recommendations as IEP um, on the CEP. So. Yeah, no, maybe I just, well, thanks for having me here and thank you very much for the very interesting presentations from the project. Maybe I just wanted first to, to just reply to something that was, well, stress something that was said today that actually we were analyzing some of the CAP strategic plans uh, last year and one thing that we, that actually was, became quite evident to us was that there's, a, there's an issue with the current, uh, the, the monitoring and evaluation framework as it is and with the choice of indicators as they are used, which is clearly not helping to achieve any results. Well, also the fact that there's a lack of clear targets. No? So uh, I think all these combined uh, explains part of the failure with the agro-environmental uh, schemes. And uh, one thing that I wanted to, to stress, because I was happy to see that, is that, um, for instance, if we look um, into the, the area devoted to, to the non-productive uh, features, which quite unfortunately right now there's a new derogation but um, but it's not about the quantity I mean we know there's some studies out there that say we would need at least 10 percent of the of the area and to actually reach the objective of the cap which is to halt biodiversity loss and if we look at biodiversity um, but uh, there again is it about the quantity or is it about the quality and which areas are we targeting so the current indicators as we have them in the cap we we see the amount of land under for a certain intervention or that's um, are gonna reply or gonna gonna be used to build towards a, to, to walk towards a certain objective but the issue is that this is not very telling because we don't know about the ambition of that uh, particular intervention and when you go down into the detail within the, the, the strategic plans themselves um, it just keeps be being watered down, so you have a very nice heading, and then when you see the actual implementation, that lacks quite a lot of ambition. And then, uh, on the other hand, is it really placed in the location where it should? And I think that's where collective approaches, and this was mentioned today as well, are needed as well. We need more landscape integration to make sure that we're, it's not just about the figures that we need to attain, it's about having an impact. And so, just to conclude on this, um, we need to change the indicators that we are using. We need to go towards impact. But, we, but for that, we need to know where we're going. Um, so just to integrate a few of the things that we have in our thinking at IEP that actually resonate very well with what was explained today, and I think these models can really um, help us achieve this. And then also from the practitioner point of view, because landowners, land managers, but yourself, you're also linked to a family farm in Portugal. So your reactions? I have a lot of thoughts. <laughs> I just don't know where to start. Probably I'll start with, uh, with the purpose of, uh, of the event, right? And the, the, this idea of the importance of monitoring and data and more and more data is, is part of our lives, right? And there's still a lot of questions associated with it. Uh, but it's still good to, to see that the more in depth we go, the more questions raises, the more the, the limitations, the more room for improvement. Um, and it's important that a lot of people recognize that involving the ones that are uh, then asked to, to apply the policies, not only the policy makers, but also the ones that, that apply the policies, it's, uh, it's probably the, the um, from the earlier it starts, <laughs> the probably the best. Um, so that that was a, um, a point. Um, but there were several things that I, I wanted to to comment to, to comment on. Um, you mentioned, for instance, this idea of uh, moving away from from the economics. I'm assuming you say it's not really moving away. It's at the environmental part, because <laughs> the problem is, from a farmer point of view, the economics will be part of it. To be fair, any economic sector, right? So we, we could, shouldn't expect the farmer to, oh, actually, no, for me, environmental is more, uh, environmental part is more important. So 
Yes, true to add to it, and that uh, also because we've been asking for ages now that uh, the, the more positive externalities, public goods, ecosystem services should be re rewarded, right? The system we have, uh, there's a lot of room for improvement there. <laughs> and indeed, putting numbers into it is the, is the way to go into more results-based, which is what also you were mentioning. I, I will not go as far as saying we need to replace the current indicators. I would go again, add to it, because you will still need because, um, well, one of the characteristics of the CEP is that it regulates all the farmland in Europe, uh, considering all the different soil types of crops and so on and so forth. And it's still important to have a, a kind of a, a general image of uh, the tendency of where it goes, even if indeed the, this move towards more result-based payment, even if it will not be tomorrow, the tendency uh, should, should be there, indeed. Um, but I wouldn't be as pessimistic as saying that this new reform doesn't uh, not, uh, open a window to go in that direction. I, I would agree with, uh, with some of the colleagues being putting a more positive note <laughs> uh, into it. Um, even as far as maybe even including your, your cycles. Uh, well, um, again, without changing the treaty, <laughs> but the fact that there is a more um, strategic approach, a more this tendency of decentralizing, uh, we could see, and we, we could include some of those aspects already within the new delivery model. Um, it is true that now, of course, you know, we are in Brussels, it's always the new thing, right? It's, it's still the same problem, we just change the name, <laughs> uh, and, and oh, we need to change everything and reform, and reform uh, all it together. But, it's still a recent thing. It's still, it's, it only started uh, last year, right? We need to, to give it time. And actually, the, the, the more direct reactions we have from, from members and from the managing authorities we speak to is that they're, they're actually worse now than before, uh, according to, to a lot of them, because there's still the changes in, in governance. Uh, there's still a lot of more questions in the air. So we need to indeed give time uh, because uh, there was a lot of change, uh, and we shouldn't just dismiss the, the windows that were open. Um, there was a lot of comments, but okay. anyway. I could there will be a, a second round. I'm just checking with the room how many questions, urgent ones, we have in the room. No? <gasps> then, because we can also Privacy. continue during the lunch. <laughs> okay, so... Keeping that in mind, the first one, okay. Can I have right. a comment? Yeah, so one minute for the privacy and then we're going the other way around um, with, with the next questions. Yes. One minute. Um, it was, Tass was raised an important point of, yes, we need that and that, that is true and we shouldn't really care about issues of privacy. Uh, that I'm not so sure, <laughs> representing landowners, right? <laughs> so, because um, there is still a question of, well, two things, trust, which, eh, and also what we're focusing on, and, and especially now with the, with the Green Deal, what we, what we recognize is that a lot of, of, when we're talking about data and AI and satellites, is the idea of control rather than uh, having this approach of, oh, we can actually use it for, uh, you know, bottom up. Uh, spread best practices, a different type of mentality. Uh, but maybe because I'm in Brussels, I, I listen more to the first one, to the control, to the control part. Uh, so, so that I think there's some room of improvement there, um, and on the trust as well. Um, there is because. Uh, there is a big risk of uh, the technology advancing much more than actually you know we are able to accommodate it to a certain extent, and uh, having at least some processes to allow for, you know, correction or a bit more transparency, things that it, we're not really discussing now, because even, for instance, we're talking about data and even the EU, who is actually responsible for what? We're talking about, uh, uh, I don't know, forest monitoring <laughs> or soil, or the soil a bit less. Uh, uh, oh, I can, yeah. Uh, and uh, the, the way, uh, who, who, is, who is gathering the data? Who analyzes the data? Decisions on aggregation, who makes them? And all of those basic things are still, are still up in the air. So, well, uh, more questions than <laughs> Just, yes, but we are going, so Elizabeth now, yeah, that will be just uh, that way. Um, also, because we have the structural dialogue, we have plenty of things going on, so uh, if you'd like to add something, and, and the work done also by EEP uh, as such, 
a second round, on, and bit, then we'll on, be taking the, the questions. Yeah. On how to address all these yeah. issues, you mean? Yeah, no, I think there's there's many, many things that can be done. There's a lot of things that are being done. Well, there's I think that I didn't want to be so negative, but I think the CAP strategic plans, the, the fact that now we have a more tailored approach to the CAP, I think that's overall positive, and there's still a lot of margin to, for maneuver, I think, to improve this. Uh, there's maybe two things um, which could help advance in this process, and one is a change in governance. And when I mean this process, I mean because we're talking about the environment today, so uh, the integration of, of the CAP with uh, Green Deal objectives uh, as well, um, wh whatever is left of them <laughs> by the end of the year. But um, in a, first would be governance uh, involving different kind of authorities at different, say, levels, but also integrating a lot more um, the uh, environmental and climate authorities into the process. So as to avoid this big gap between setting certain objectives that are then uh, unattainable. Um, then the design um, of the financing as well could be, could be changed in different ways, uh, having more bonuses, but even in terms of the, of the funding that is given to the, to the different member states, well, uh, if some member states come up with strategic plans that are more ambitious, why not reward for that? I mean, there's, there's many, many options on the table that could be that could be discussed. And then, of course, at the, at the other side of the, of the balance is, is what's the role for land managers, and I think that's where the strategic dialogue also comes in. But we, it's not just the strategic dialogue, it's the whole process um, discussing with ICAP. So how do we incentivize land managers? How do we make sure that what goes into the, into the plants is actually feasible? Is it something that is going to be attractive for them? Is it well rewarded? And it was mentioned also today that the role of the advisory services, which is crucial and is something we think that should be rethought, refunded. Um, I don't think we can stress enough the importance of advisory also to reduce the risk of, of farmers or the perception of the risk. Um, it goes both ways, as it was said today. So uh, farmers are trained, but at the same time, advisors get this precious information of what is working on the ground, what is not, and then this can, get, this can go up and down. So uh, those are two things that I would, that I would stress. Dasos? Uh, yeah, yeah, let me come up with points that you both mentioned, uh, especially you before, not uh, now. Uh, and stress once more what I meant with uh, privacy and also the need to prioritize. You can open all fronts at the same time, but you're bound to lose in the modern world. So that's why I keep stressing soil. Now, the idea for turning the FADN into a farm sustainability data network with a different name started in 2012, we're 2024. I was in Australia and they were, I saw they were measuring carbon in the soil in 2000 plots. When I came back today, uh, two weeks later, I was in, in Greece in an olive grove in South Peloponnese where they were measuring exactly the same thing. I said, the heck, we have 80,000 farms with data, why don't we bring it together? We had a whole research project, the Flint, uh, you know, tw 12 participants of member states, one member state blocked it on the basis of privacy of data. Now, Alan Matthews, that most of you know, some years ago said, ah, in, uh, in uh, the post, I think it was in uh, Twitter at the time, and this is a, a, a group that actually provides information over the last three years for three for every plot in the EU of what they have produced, what they had. And if you go, you can pay, years back, more information. So Per Luigi Londero, which also some of you know, and uh, my former director at the head of unit at the time for that and now for data, curious as it was, he clicked to see what is this farm. And it was a, a startup somewhere in Belarusia where they were downloading the data of Copernicus and selling it to everybody. That's the data that is out there right now. And if we don't realize that this data is available, then we waste our time. So data for the public good is available. Second, exactly because a lot of data, we shouldn't focus on everything. And coming back to your point, yes, I agree with you that we don't have the capacity to analyze impacts correctly. But a, a simple question. If we had focused on soil organic matter, and what exactly do we measure for that? Would it be much better off in focusing in a few indicators because then you'd know if you do something good here, maybe I don't need to have 
the, the hedges or, or uh, more protection. But here, if it doesn't work, then you need even more than what we propose. But that we simply didn't have. Why? Because we opened the front on all type of indicators, and there were even more that were being asked. And now we have so many indicators that we don't know what to do with them. Eh? Antonia, because you're also leading not only within your unit, but you're also advising inside your unit. So what are your reactions? And also, I would like to come back to the idea of how to engage more with the member states, because yeah. we're tempted to put everything on the commission. So uh, yeah. the other I, way around. I, I think, well, s several points, of course, uh, come to my mind. And, and just to, to say one, one last word on the indicators. I mean, we fully agree. Uh, what we have as target indicators are not really result indicators. They are, let's say, performance indicators as to how much land is covered under certain uh, commitments which are assessed as being effective or at least contribute. So the good news of the CAP plan compared to the RDPs before is indeed that uh, for the very important indicators for biodiversity, for soil, uh, for biodiversity, we doubled the area covered by, by commitments, and for soil, we tripled. But of course, I fully agree with you that uh, to, to, to give that as a positive note, uh, that would not be fair without saying we have to look at what, what exactly are the commitments behind. Uh, we need to work with impact and, uh, indicators, that's clear, but this goes along with the discussion, or this goes, let's say, just in the other direction of, of the policy cycles. Because impact indicators, and we have seen that today, on, on be it nutrients, be it carbon, uh, carbon storage, be it, be it birds, they don't happen from one year to another. So, uh, and uh, just, uh, just to say, you can believe me, not so many governments are sitting here now, and not so many, but when we come up with 44 result indicators with a hand of around 30 impact indicators, and we have to measure output because we are dealing with public money, you can believe me, ma managing authorities are not super happy. <laughs> and we try to improve the, the uh, policy monitoring and evaluation framework uh, further and further, but it's a hard work to do and a hard work to find the right indicators. We see we have many of them when it comes to the uh, ecological uh, effects or to the, to the environmental let's say the resources, the water, the soil, etc. When it comes to investments, we have very little to see how exactly can we monitor what member states are do doing. But this is why we have evaluation for. Then of course it's true that evaluation cycles are hardly managing with the next programming cycle. But if we would ask farmers, oh please wait five years, we have no CAP support, but if we know what the others have been done and then we continue new, I'm not so sure whether they're gonna be happy neither. So the good news, we doubled many, uh, in, uh, many uh, let's say the, the area coverage. The bad news, of course, is we have to look in detail what the commitments are doing. We have far too little result based where we really pay for the results. We have good examples for the biodiversity, for example, also for carbon we get it, also for water we get it, but little. So member states still don't dare enough to do so. And most importantly, and here I'm very happy that the Dutch ministry is here, because most importantly is the territorial approach. And I think that was said at several occasions. I think everybody said that the spatial distribution of, of the schemes is, is key. And we have little corporate uh, collective assessment. We have luckily the Dutch example. We see that uh, there are still difficulties also due to the cap rules and uh, in implementing them effectively, so member states do not dare. But uh, those are the ways to go for, for the future and uh, we promote it, but, and we try to find uh, where are the, let's say, the barriers to implement them. And Ignacio, the last word for you, because as we are also entering to this new cycle um, against restarting about the reform of the CEP, the transitional year with the elections. Um, so yeah, love the, the, the last words for you before I will be taking, uh, taking the, 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 the one and only question, and then we'll continue with the lunch, we, you can exchange, and then I will give one minute to each of the project to react to what was said 
uh, before. Okay, that's how we will finish. Yeah, thanks a lot. I want to be a little bit provocative. I mean, we, we have a situation, I mean, and maybe going back to economic sustainability, no? So what I wanted to say is that price is very important, that we have been uh, looking at price feedback uh, for a long time, but we uh, maybe uh, center too much the economic, the economic sustainability part and miss the environmental part. We have a situation right now with food inflation, very high prices. Agri Farmers did not make so much money in their lives uh, as last year, 2023. Uh, we have a cap that has been there that, that has not decreased. I mean, it has been reshuffled and uh, maybe reoriented to other goods. And we have a cap that has been given to the member states so that they are, uh, they are they, they, because they were always complaining that horizontal legislation was not enough and they wanted to uh, target the CAP and we have the farmers in the streets. So there is other issues here. I mean, there's other issues. It's not about agricultural income here. Maybe it's bureaucracy, it's, uh, it's red tape, uh, maybe um, it's like an accumulation of, uh, of, of uh, um, maybe of, of policies that are kind of indirectly affecting farmers and they do not really understand. We, we have the climate law just uh, released. We have uh, pesticides, uh, attempts on the pesticides uh, legislation, the animal welfare legislation that we have been doing the impact assessment for. So it's, it's complicated. So this is maybe uh, something we should debate or should look, uh, maybe uh, reflect uh, upon ourselves. Now, one more comment on, on data. I think this is very, very important to have, I mean, and I support a lot what, what Tasso said, to have data available in a certain format. There's, there's ways to, uh, to protect uh, farmers' uh, confidential information. We do that all the time. We have FADN uh, rules, we have so on. But I'm, I'm saying this because if you, we want to target the CAP, uh, and the, the CAP is for the farmers, and if we want to tar target the farmers and the, and the rice performance indicators, maybe hopefully uh, result indicators at some point, we need to have the data to do the analysis. And the same goes for the food chain. I mean, we do a lot of analysis in the food chain. We don't know where the, where the margins go. And this is helping the farmers. Who is getting the, the money? So on the supply side, we need to know who produces what, and what are the uh, pressure indicators linked to that production, and all along the food chain until the, 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 the food is in our fridge, we need to know where the money goes. Um, and the last point, maybe now uh, commenting from, from this kind of scientific uh, modeling uh, community, it is becoming very, very complex, and I think we saw this in these three, in these three projects to analyze the cap, because now, I mean, we spent almost a year translating all the, C the CSPs from different languages, tabulating them. Now we put them through artificial intelligence tools to try to make, uh, and we're helping DG Agri also on this, try to make sense of all these uh, 27 CAPs. And, 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 and this, is, this is nuts. This is very complicated to, to analyze. So uh, the policy and the, and the reality in terms of uh, environmental pressures is moving much faster than what we are actually able to, to do uh, uh, on the analytical front, so so we need to have a dialogue here and, and try to try to develop policies that that can be monitored and can be analyzed and uh, ex ante, uh, not only just exposed but ex ante, uh, as, as we mentioned before. Some of the indicators appear in a few years' time, so there is a time there is a time lag here that we have to consider. So just uh, just to raise that that, that warning. Thanks. And, and also in the changing climate change world, it's true that it's also affecting exactly. much more uh, all the discussions. I will be taking a short question. Thank you very much. My name is Liam McHale from the Irish Farmers Association. Um, going back to a word that was mentioned, I found very engaging the, of research and, and policy. Tassos mentioned frustration earlier. And in Ireland, we had a thousand tractors out last Thursday. Uh, protesting. And it's frustration. Farmers delivering the same message, but it seems to have been ignored. We asked with farm to fork, reduction of pesticides, yield will go down, significant cut on, on, on income. Organic farmers, commission said, you'll get a premium for your goods. We have farmers, and the price for organic is not higher than con conventional products. And in the food chain, and Ignacio, you just referred to it, where is the margin going? Tasso said it's a black box. 
we went to, during the energy crisis, we went to the retailer and said, our poultry farmers need two more cents per egg because of the cost. They wouldn't meet with us. We surrounded the supermarket with tractors, and at 8 o'clock the next morning, the general director met with the farmers. It's, it's, it's difficult. Um, you mentioned, Tassos, that there are good examples out there. Unfortunately, the political calendar is different from the farming calendar. In Ireland, we have found that cows emit different levels of methane. So some emit a lot, and some emit less for the same quantity of milk. So we've got a program funded by CAP to breed those lower methane emitting cows. But cows only have one calf per year. This breeding program will take time to change. And unfortunately, the political calendar doesn't allow us that. So my question, how do we lobby better as farmers to get our issues heard? <laughs> <laughs> There's a daring question. Yeah, thanks, Liam. And uh, we met before and discussed the the Irish plan and the uh, so so many things on, on the Irish plan and and uh, to for this uh, genomic. Uh, program for the cows, uh, we were very skeptical on this one, you know, because of the timeline and because there is no limitations in livestock next, clearly linked to that. So we had a lot of questions on this. I think it's not so much about lobbying farmers' interests. It's, it's very much coming back to the thing of what we had before on the advice. We have to show the advantages of the agro-environmental schemes as just to take these as an example. And, and I've seen really a change in the, let's say, in the last two years when we have the ministries coming to Agri, speaking to our DG, and sometimes I have the honor to, to join, um, when they say, yes, all of a sudden, yeah, I feel there is drought, I feel there is flood. So, we feel there is climate change, this affects us. Just taking this as an example, promoting, let's say, just also an example that easily to, to imagine and to, to understand what it is, is agroforestry. Showing the advantage for the production of agroforestry, which can be promoted by, by rather either eco-schemes or agro-environmental schemes. So showing that uh, improving farm practices in a way that is supported, and I come to the premier in a second, uh, can also improve water retention. We see floods and drought and w weather extremes that farming community has to manage somehow. We see a drought in Catalonia in, in January, which we never experienced before. So something on the soil has to be done in order to, to retain moisture whenever it comes. And uh, biodiversity and, and pesticide uh, or pest pressure is the same. We have to demonstrate better the advantages of certain practices. It's not... Uh, to, it's, and, and I think it was said this morning, it's a different story to be told. It's... Uh, we, we should not see the environmental legislation as a threat to the farmers, but as the way to help the farmers, because otherwise, uh, and, and we have the, in, this, in this discussion on food security versus environment, we have to make clear, if we don't manage to preserve biodiversity and to, uh, to do our contribution to, to my, uh, climate mitigation, as well as to adapt to climate mitigation, there will be no food security in the future. And this is maybe links also to, to the premier. We already, there's always this complaint, we need an incentive approach, et cetera, et cetera. I don't want to go into the deep discussions of amber box and green box here. Um, the regulations are there. The regulation says taking the, the targets into account, setting uh, for, for, for the environmental uh, interventions, both in the eco schemes and the agro environmental. Member states are not doing it. Member states are not programming. We can't observe when you say there is little uptake of the uh, agro-environmental uh, schemes. We, we do not observe that money is left over for the agro-environment at a big scale in the different member states. 
There is, of course, adoption and sometimes there is reduction in the, in the budget for agri-environment, but my colleagues are here to prevent that and they get very angry if, if, if uh, member states want to take money out of, of what was measure 10, uh, so agri-environmental schemes in, in the former period as well as now. Uh, so we see adaptions, uh, so adaptations of the plants in both directions. What we do not see is that at a large scale farmers do not take up. But of course, what is programmed? So it's a question what is programmed in the plants. It's a question whether we still have member states who compensate only partly the cost incurred in income foregone. So we don't have even to discuss whether cost incurred in income foregone is enough as long as we have member states paying only 60% or 70% of the cost incurred in income foregone. So it's a willingness in the member states to, to see the opportunities to program right schemes with ad uh, adequate payments they can, the regulation allows that, uh, the regulation even clearly says, take the targets into account that you have, so take the, the, the most, to translate that easily, take the most expensive area into account when uh, programming a measure, and then it is uh, very economically interesting for all the other farmers. Member states are not doing that. Thank you very much. So last minute for Tassos, then we'll be ending and continuing the discussions during the, the light lunch. Um, so yeah, Tassos. Yeah, uh, I will not advise farmers or anybody else how to lobby and I made it very clear that in my current life I will not deal with lobbying. But I would like to go a little bit beyond what we're discussing now because, I mean, uh, at some point we need to also agree that, uh, I still remember we were supposed to have a, strategic plans of 200 pages in 1,000 and 2,000, so we might have done something wrong ourselves. I think what we need to do is to decide at the European Union level what the heck we want to do with agricultural and the food systems. And you need a four-dimensional approach. We all learned that you know sustainability has the three dimensions, the economy, uh, the environment, and the social dimension, and there are trade-offs. But there is a bigger trade-off that we had ignored, and that's the fourth dimension. It's time, and it's uh, geostrategic uh, changes that are taking place right now. And when? With an agricultural and a food system that needs to improve a lot. We have managed a self-flagellation for decades now. Instead of pointing out what are the things that we're doing well, and what are the things we're doing wrong, and all the focus on, on what we're doing wrong, then it's no accident that we are where we are. And we're not only doing it in the food systems, we're doing it a lot here because there is a budget that goes to the common agricultural policy, we're doing it everywhere. And that's a big problem that we're having as a European Union. What is our role in the world? We're 5% of the population, but we have something to show and we don't have a capacity to communicate what we're doing globally, both in the, the weaknesses we have, but also in the strengths, and especially on the strength part. And I think we'll be all lobbying in June, going or not, to vote for the European elections. So there is still the potential for all the European citizens. So a very big warm welcome to the speakers, to the audience. Thank you very much for staying with us. Uh, to the entire team, tech team, um, all the teams who put that event together and then just enjoy the lunch and we continue with the discussions. And everything will be posted on the farm website, RISE websites after. So just uh, wait for the message and everything will be available. Thank you very much. Yeah, everything.